Welcome to Candid Catholic Convos, a program brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg. Our mission is to humanize the church and help you to grow in your faith, love, and understanding. I'm your host, Rachel Troche, a cradle Catholic who's only human and struggled with faith on more than one occasion. Each week, you'll hear engaging, down-to-earth interviews and actionable strategies you can implement into your life with ease to help you grow closer to God. If you're ready to open your heart and step fully into the person God created you to be, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hello, and thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Candid Catholic Convos. This week, the diocese participated in the National March for Life in Washington, D.C., with several of our churches and members of our Catholic Life and Evangelization team joining the thousands fighting to protect the rights of the unborn. And you might be thinking, but wait, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Why are we still marching? Why is this still a thing? Well, because overturning the ruling wasn't a finish line. It was a starting line. While it's a major step in the right direction, overturning Roe does not end abortion. Overturning Roe actually returns the ability to protect the unborn back to the American people through their elected officials, both federally and in the states. And with so many pregnancy resource centers at risk for losing funding, continuing to march and advocate is more impactful now than it has been in the last 50 years. We've talked about this topic a lot on Candid Catholic Convos, so today we dug deep into the archives and compiled a compendium, like a best of episode, on all the topics of pro-life just for you. The first segment is from episode 37 with Samantha Pavlock, CEO and editor-in-chief of Femme Catholic, with what mainstream would call a radical reframe of the term feminism and how that incorporates with our Catholic beliefs. The next segment is from episode 11 with Dr. Anne-Marie Manning and Dr. Naomi Whitaker about what an abortion is and isn't. And it also features advice for those in a season of an unexpected pregnancy or uncertainty or who are questioning their decision to utilize the abortion pill. The third segment is from episode 33, and it's all about pro-life policymaking and the ways Eric Failing and the PA Catholic Conference are advocating not just for the unborn, but for a whole life, which is especially important this election year. So I hope you enjoy. I hope it motivates you to take some action. And I'll see you back here next week. Let's address the elephant in the room, because I know that there is a big misunderstanding regarding the definition of feminism. So just doing a quick Internet search, it's defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of political, social and economic equality to men. And a deeper search shows that the original feminist movement began in waves, you know, starting with women's suffrage and the right to own property and evolving to address concerns like education and workplace equality and sexuality. But I think a lot of that gets lost because the actual definition leaves a lot of room for interpretation. There are a lot of feminists who identify as pro-life, while others argue you can't be a feminist if you're against abortion or LGBTQ rights or even mentioning men's rights and how advocating for women can actually benefit men. So in your opinion, how do you define feminism and why isn't it more a, a more blanketed term like egalitarianism or humanism? a great question um it's interesting to see even you know so i started femme catholic back in 2016 and in the past five six seven years how much has changed to me the word feminism is important because it identifies the fact that women have particular needs that that are different than sort of all humans um It's the same reason we talk about, you know, even pro-life issues. We're talking about a particular group of people who need support in a particular way or need, you know, to to be defended. Identifying that group of people is important so that we can talk about the things that matter to them. And part of the reason I, you know, and I didn't call the the blog like feminist Catholics. I, I wanted to just use that femme Catholic, um, because it also is a nod to the word female. And I think that has become, you know, and I never expected that to so quickly become the issue that it is today. But 
I really think it's important to call out the fact that female human beings have a particular experience of life. They have, you know, God created us male and female that reveals something. Talking about women as women is important. And I also find it really interesting that Pope John Paul II used the word and actually called for what he called a new feminism. So in, um, he wrote a bunch of documents about women that are wonderful. I, I really highly recommend, uh, you can Google Letter to Women by Pope John Paul II. It's not very long, it's online. He wrote that in 1995 and he talked about the need for Catholics to you know, fight for women's rights and women's equality and, and the oppression that women have faced around the world. Uh, in different parts of the world, especially more than others, that that's just a Catholic human dignity, you know, effort to do. But the other document he wrote that maybe more people are familiar with is Evangelium Vitae, which was sort of a pro-life encyclical. Um, it was all about, um, it's called On the Dignity of Life, Evangelium Vitae. And it's actually in that document, I think is really interesting, where he calls for a new feminism. He says, women need to rise up in a quote, new feminism. And so he uses that word. And I think he was such an intentional man that that's not a coincidence that he chose to use that word. And so that's sort of where we are grounding our work is, is campaigning for a new feminism in uh, the spirit of his teachings in the Catholic church. But yeah, I think it's really important to identify the group of people who need help so that you can address the problem and, and address the issue from there. Right. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, to really drill down into it if you don't really know where you're drilling. So I think that, that yeah. I agree. I think that's really super important. Well, and like you said, the history is really important too, because if you look at feminism in the early 1900s, there were feminists who were pro-life. They were very pro-family, you know, the same women who were fighting for prohibition were women that were fighting for women's rights and, and what's good for family and children. And then in the 60s and 70s, it really did get sort of caught up in the sexual revolution. And feminism and the sexual revolution became very intertwined as a political movement. And you still see that today where, you know, abortion is key to women's equality. Okay, I don't agree with that, obviously. That's very problematic. I shouldn't have to, you know, kill my children to be equal. And the Catholic Church thinks the same thing, that you sh that's not what women's equality is grounded in. Um, and I think the world really needs that message as a pro-woman message today to, to untangle feminism and gender equality from women's rights uh, or from abortion and from some, the sexual revolution. Yes, I 100% agree that it's it's gotten to one in the same and it's it's very much a separate issue yeah there's a great book by a uh, catholic investigative journalist she used to work for cosmopolitan magazine like back in the day um and she the book is called subverted and she talks all about her experience working for cosmo and how she kind of lived through those movements becoming intertwined and, and watching that happen. It's really interesting. So that's a great book. Yes, I have. It's on my list to read. I haven't read it yet, but I did watch an interview with her and she is just enthralling and I can't wait to get my hands on this book. I, I feel like you were mentioning that the term pro-life, like John Paul II never m might not actually even use it. He uses the dignity of human life because the term pro-life is so politically charged and I feel like they do that to create fear and to stir up fear in that, you know, if you don't choose this, this will happen. So, so, you know, and with the recent events of Roe v. Wade being overturned, I've seen an enormous amount of fear and judgment from both sides that the concern is that a post-Roe world would return to pre-Roe norms where back before Roe, women might have been coerced into adoption because no one was willing to support them much like now where they might be coerced into abortion for the same reason. And when you dig into it, I think people's biggest fear is that there won't be enough care to go around. You know, if you're, they feel like any care for the child comes at the expense of the mother and vice versa. But it seems like there's a lot more visibility and a lot more ad dollars on one side than there is on the other. 
how can we as Catholic feminists spread awareness to the resources that are available and have more productive conversations? So I think um, there's a Catholic concept of called subsidiarity, which is this idea that you should focus on like your local community. So I, I think if you even think about the way, you know, we have the Pope and the, the Vatican, but then we have dioceses and we have parishes and there each parish priest has a responsibility for his local, the people in his diocese, you know, um, there sometimes we're so quick to talk about broad scale things that need to happen in politics that we actually forget, like, what is your parish doing to support moms? Because there was a 2017, 2018 study that the CARA Foundation did with America Magazine on women in the church. And less than 20% of women said that they very much agree their parishes supports new moms. That's only one in five. Wow. So that means four out of five, 80% of Catholic women who, you know, identify as Catholic um, and they may not be going to church regularly, but they identify as Catholic. And their perception is that the, the church, you know, does not very much support new moms. And so even just talking to the moms in your parish and saying like, what do you need? What would be helpful? It's small things. Like my parish has a, I guess it's a cry room, <laughs> but it's, it's a room, you know, in the back of church, uh, with some toys and they have a TV broadcasting the mass because you, you, there's not a window, but they have a sign in there. They call it the St. Gianna room after St. Gianna Mola, who was a, a working mom doctor, but they have a sign in there saying, you know, we would love for children to be in mass, but we also know that sometimes babies need to nurse or moms, you know, kids just need to move their legs. And this is a space for you, you know, to still be part of mass, but also be here if it's, if it's easier for you. Just so welcoming, I think, because it versus making parents feel like, oh, I have to keep their kids quiet um, and out of the church, because I know a lot of parents feel like that. And so I think in terms of resources, I really want to, and it's harder, it's not as fun. It's it, like, notice that resistance when I say, focus on local resources. Notice how you probably feel a little bit like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, there, there's something more exciting or grandiose about it focusing on big picture. But again, I think as Catholics, we really have to pray about we're called to that subsidiarity. And so even it could be just reaching out to a new mom in your parish and saying, Hey, you know, my kids are grown. Can I come over and watch your kids? I know you just had a baby. I would love that. <laughs> if somebody did that for me, oh my gosh. Um, you know, Hey, can I watch your kids or Hey, can I bring me dinner or those little things really matter when you're in the trenches every day with small kids. And, and that just builds community. And again, I think being that witness that is way more powerful than people realize. If Catholic churches were thriving communities of pro-life witness, I think that would really resonate with people. And then in terms of how to have more productive conversations, I think something I always keep in mind is that one in four women have had an abortion. So, you know, more women, more women have had abortions than think their parish supports pregnant women. Um, but one in four women have had an abortion. I guarantee you, you know, multiple people who've had abortions. And as I've started to talk about this more, more of those people have come out to me and told me, you know, yeah, I had an abortion or somebody just told me, you know, my sister had an abortion in high school. It's something people don't want to talk about, but it, it's common. And so when we're talking about these topics, people are not just talking about the politics of it in the sky. They're talking about their sister or they're talking about, you know, their mom who may have told them that they had an abortion back in the day, or people are talking about people they care about. And I think we just have to be sensitive to that and, and understand, okay, you know, do you know anybody in your life who's had an abortion or what do you think they needed? And we interviewed actually back in 2018, we did a survey anonymously, women who've had abortions, what did you need? And how are you doing now? And the findings, you know, it's, a, it's what a lot of pro-life people talk about. The findings were basically that they didn't know there was support available. They didn't know there were actually people out there who would help. So I think continuing to promote those things. But if, if the women who are having babies in your community don't feel supported, than women who are trying to decide whether to have a baby 
aren't going to know those resources exist. Um, so I actually think if we work on just supporting women who are having babies, <laughs> the rest will kind of follow from there. My next question is a little bit of a tough one. Abortion has been in the news a lot lately, especially with, you know, my body, my choice and the new law in Texas. And I read a statistic that was very sad that said um, one in four women has had an abortion and 78.3% have felt pressure to have an abortion. But many may not know what exactly it is. Do you think you could walk us through scientifically what an abortion is? What happens when a woman requests an abortion? That depends a little bit on what type of abortion that she has and when in pregnancy that it occurs. Um, we are seeing more and more um, pressure and, and, and numbers of folks who are having what are called medical abortions. Um, that sounds really clean and it makes a lot of women, I think, feel like more comfortable, perhaps, that it's a medical procedure. Um, but at the end of the day, every abortion is the ending of the life of a life that the woman is carrying inside her. Okay, whatever time of pregnancy that happens. Medical abortions achieve that end by first off taking women take a medication to um, block the effects of progesterone. Progesterone is necessary in the early part of pregnancy for the um, developing embryo to properly implant in the uterus and, and, and uh, have a good safe place to grow. Um, so by blocking that pro the progesterone effect, um, the baby cannot implant, the, the developing embryo uh, baby can implant properly. Um, and then an additional medication is given after the progesterone to cause the uterus to contract and force um, that developing baby out. Um, so that's a that's done in the early part of pregnancy. Okay, um, success rates vary um, in terms of how early in pregnancy it's done. The further along in pregnancy, the less likely that that's that is to be a successful abortion. Um, then surgical abortion um, is when the the cervix is forcibly dilated and the contents of the uterus, um, developing baby placental tissue. Around, Etc. is um, suctioned or scraped out, generally early on scraped, uh, suctioned out. Okay. Um, later in pregnancy, as the baby is bigger, you have to actually, um, the baby is of such a size that if you do that, you actually have to pull it to pieces in order to get it out. So the baby is forcibly um, destroyed um, and removed in pieces. Um, all of these have complications and potential problems for the mother who is undergoing them. There is no such thing as, you know, they say we want to make it safe. Um, all of these things have risks and potential complications for mom. Um, surgical abortions um, risk actual immediate um, injury to, to mother, whether it's cervix, uterus, okay, uterine perforations, um, which can bleed, introduction of infection. These things certainly happen, okay, with, with um, surgical abortions, um, to the point that you know, the women, there is a risk of death, there is a risk of, of infection, long-term infertility. Um, some women, women lose their uterus, okay? Um, I don't want to, to be accused of trying to scare women out of it. Certainly it's not the majority of women, okay? The, the, but it definitely happens and, and we need to acknowledge that that happens um, to women. Um, if, the, if the cervix is forcibly dilated, to allow the baby to be extracted. Um, there is potential in subsequent pregnancies. The cervix may not function as well. So we know in women who've had surgical abortions, their risk of premature labor in a subsequent pregnancy is higher. Even a medical abortion, they're, they're not always, um, even those that are, should be, so we say successful in terms of ending the pregnancy, bleeding can be heavy. Oftentimes, uh, a surgical completion or is necessary because all of the tissue doesn't come out. All of the placental tissue is not extruded and the woman can continue to bleed and bleed very heavily. Um, that can lead to the need for a DNC. That can lead to serious blood loss. Um, uh, there can be infection related to that. And women have died from medical abortions too. Okay. It's not just the surgical abortion that carries a risk of death. Um, I would like to put in a plug and I'll let Dr. Whitaker add what she wants to, but um, 
I would like to put in a plug for reversal of medical abortions. Um, that is um, the one thing that, that the, the pro-abortion um, lobby is trying to minimize our women's un- knowledge about this. But if a woman ha- starts a medical abortion and changes her mind, and that certainly happens because a lot of women are pressured into abortion. So if she takes those pills that prevent pro- progesterone from working, but has not yet taken the pill that causes the uterus to contract and force the placental tissue and the baby out. It is possible to reverse the process of abortion by overriding that progesterone blocker. And we do that by giving her so much progesterone that we sort of overwhelm the system and there, and the baby then can survive that early attempt. And Dr. Um, Whitaker is a good resource for this. There is, um, you, you'll remember the, the, the website. Abortion Reversal Network. Yeah. Um, there, you can go online there, Abortion Pill Reversal Network, and um, find um, providers who will help you with that service anytime, day or night. It's an emergency service because that does have to happen as soon as possible after you take those first pills. It's interesting to note that usually the providers who prescribe these medications don't deal with the complications. They get sent to our practice. Um, emergency rooms randomly. Emergency rooms, whoever's covering an emergency room, um, those with hospital privileges. And also, um, you know, I've seen an emotional toll of these women for many years later and um, a guilt that comes with future pregnancies um, or if, you know, they wait 10, 20 years to start a family because they were young and they had a termination, they carry that with them. They blame themselves for infertility, even though, you know, it's probably not related, but um, it, it, it can haunt some people for the rest of their lives. And yeah, usually it's, it's often done in the moment of fear or pressure. For most women, I think if they have someone to support them and really talk it through, Uh, are given all the options, including, you know, giving the baby up for adoption Um, with time and support. A lot of women are very happy and are able to heal from a lot of trauma from an unplanned pregnancy, whatever the circumstances are, because oftentimes there's a lot of other issues going on um, and and they're able to heal and a good thing can come from a very difficult situation. Those are really good to know, especially that resource, um, abortion pill reversal. Um, I'll definitely put that in the show notes for anyone who's looking. What advice would you give to a young mother or any mother coming into your practice who's who's unsure of what she should do because maybe she's facing pressure from her family or her friends to terminate a pregnancy, but she's kind of on that line. She's not sure where she should go. First of all, I would say take your time. I don't think anybody should have an abortion, obviously, um, but certainly if you personally are not a hundred percent convinced that this is that you are doing this because it's what you think is best to do, you absolutely should not be. So no woman should have an abortion because her boyfriend or her husband told her she had to, that nobody else will take care of her. She's on her own or because her parents are pressuring her, um, whether they think she's too young or can't handle it or they don't, I mean, don't rush into making this decision. First of all, and secondly, look out there for, you know, what resources are there? I, I've had so many young women come in to, to see me who were terrified to talk to their parents. And once they actually spoke to their parents, they didn't really get the response that they expected. There was a lot more support there than they thought there was going to be. So sometimes they feel pressure about things that they think are going to happen that aren't even real. <laughs> so first of all, give yourself time. If your family is not supportive, if your boyfriend is not supportive, there are lots of people who want to help you, Um, whether it's the Crisis Pregnancy Center down the street um, or um, a physician that you know. We we see women, um, we get calls from the Crisis Pregnancy Center, um, not not infrequently to say, you know, so-and-so is here, the... Her family is pushing her. They said that she has to do it for this medical reason. Is this real? Is this really a concern? Will you see her? Will you talk to her? Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. I mean, they go to your crisis pregnancy center. They have contacts. They have contacts with people in the medical profession. They have contacts with, you know, people in social services. They have, they provide social support themselves. Um, there are so many groups out there that are willing to help, not just this minute when you're trying to decide what you're going to do in this moment of crisis, but down the road with support for the baby. And um, if you decide to, that you're going to, to keep the baby and parent, uh, material support and, and discussion of other options like adopting. Um, you know, adoption is not the same thing as it was in 1950. It doesn't mean you have the baby at the hospital, leave it, and some people you don't know take it home and you never have any contact with that child again. There are so many options um, that will even allow young women, um, not just young women, any women who are having a baby, <laughs> to be involved in that child's life if that's something that, that is important. Now, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, but there are so many different ways that, that you can solve the, this problem and the problem isn't the child. The problem is the situation. And we have to find a better way to solve the situation than killing the child. And I say this to all the women who come in and talk to me, um, you know, like that are, that are considering abortion. I say, what you really want is to go back in time and have not gotten pregnant. But we can't do that. I can't make you unpregnant. An abortion is not going to make this child go away. You will always have been a mother. You're either going to be the mother of a child that you allowed to be killed, or you're going to be the mother of a child who is either living with you or living with someone else and being loved. We've unfortunately run out of time, but if you'd like to hear the rest of this episode, you can listen to us anytime on Spotify under Candid Catholic Convos. Or you can download this episode from our website at hbgdiocese.org. Thank you so much for listening. Our goal at the Diocese of Harrisburg is to walk with you on your faith journey. So if this episode resonated with you in any way, the easiest way to show your appreciation is by sharing this program with your network or by leaving a review on your listening platform. You can also support us financially by making a donation online at hbgdiocese.org slash DAC and clicking the make a donation button. Thanks again, and we'll see you at church on Sunday.